Hi, I am Stephanie Hawkenhall, an author, a speaker, and an educator of Love Misunderstood Institute, a nonprofit organization. I educate about bullying and how love is misunderstood when you're bullying others. Bullying happens everywhere and has no age range. To help you through bullying and the trauma associated with it, I am a certified forgiveness coach. I am an apprentice facilitator in trauma healing. I speak and educate groups at schools, churches, events, and seminars. I look forward to sharing with your group. Hey, 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 everybody. Thanks for joining the show. You have just joined. Where, what? is where is the love i don't even remember the name of the show where is the love show i am stephanie hawken hall and i am your host please join me co-host co-host hey, <laughs> this is doing? my co-host this is gene williams my son my co-host hey gene what's happening how you doing today and i want to say <laughs> Happy Mother's Day to my beautiful mother. Oh, and thank all you. the amazing and wonderful mothers out there who happen to catch this either now or after. Happy Mother's Day, everybody, to all the mothers. <laughs> like I said, you have just joined Where is the Love show, where we talk about bullying versus love. We educate about bullying. We share information with you. We give you so much information about bullying versus love, letting you know that bullying is not love. It's not love. So to and they give you we, tools. Thank you. We give you the tools about bullying. So listen, last week on our show, we had a guest, our first guest. We had Alisa Hukko. She's a social worker practicing mental health. She shared so much information with us to help us understand the mental health side of bullying, and trauma, the trauma associated with it. So she talked about um, community involvement. She talked about it not being just about the parents uh, educating the children, but the community getting involved um, with the children. So basically you see something you say something don't just let things happen and ignore them and you know act like you don't know what's happening she also talked about technology and children she talked about uh children uh young children having these devices and how parents uh basically uh parents and grandparents being old school and believing uh, you know, hanging on to old school thoughts and ways and, you know, not being up to date with technology and what's happening in the real world and allowing the children to have technical devices, which is where so much is happening on the technical devices. We need computers to communicate. We need phones to communicate. We need this technology because this is the way of the world right now. And also she talked, I'm go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Also, she spoke on um, parents being, you know, parents and grandparents, custodians of the children being um, engaged in in the uh, the usage of technology uh, for our children, setting you no know, limits of you know of being on technology for a long amount of times, and again, just reinforcing the fact that we need to be engaged. We need to know what our children are doing, what they're looking at, what they're engaging in, who they're engaging with, things along those lines. Yes, that's very important. Um, and then she talked about uh, age, um, we, we talked about age appropriate, uh, having uh, things, having our children involved in things that are age appropriate for them uh, concerning where um, technology is concerned. Wanna add anything? Uh, no, actually, you said every, everything I was thinking. Okay. So she also talked about the dangers of not being aware of what your children children are looking at and watching uh, on, our, on their phones and on technology and also uh, the involvement uh, 
of games and social media platforms. So those were some of our discussions last week. So if you wanna hear more about the discussion and the things that were talked about, uh, go back to last week's video and check it out. So I want to remind you that bullying is, bullying is the force, coercion, um, hurtful teasing or threats to abuse aggressively, dominate or intimidate, uh, and it's seeking to harm and to control others. I wanted to make sure that I brought this up again this week uh, because people can say you're bullying them uh, or you know they're being bullied when they don't even understand what bullying is about. So I just shared the definition of bullying with you. So I wanna say, <laughs> if just because somebody asks you a question, would you like it if I treated you this way or if somebody treated you the same way you're treating others? Don't get offended and lie and say you're bullying them. That's asking a question. And what else is it doing, Gene? It's also holding the person accountable for their actions. Yes. And letting you letting you know that when you do something or you treat people a certain way, whatever you put out, you get back. So would you want the same treatment? It's just creating a mirror. You know, right. you 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 don't see your actions unless you see them from the eyes or the, the perspective of another person. So it's just flipping flipping that reality back on you. Would you want someone else to treat you like this? XYZ. Right. So so I wanted to make sure, again, that I told what that definition means for those that just go around, may go around saying somebody is bullying me, bullying me just because they're saying something to you that you, you don't, don't like. Me. If it's not negative, if it's not trying to the control mean, you or to coerce you or to force you to do something, um, it's not bullying. What did you say, Gene? Uh, I was just agreeing, uh, you know, manipulating and controlling you. You know, yes. trying to force a perspective upon you, things like that. So, you know, yeah. questions are questions. You don't get to know situations or understand them without asking questions. Right. If you're not asking questions, you're assuming. Yes. And when you're assuming, that means you don't have all the information. Right. So you ask questions to get all the information to make an intelligent decision based off of all the information you've been given. And not only that, you are bringing it to the person's attention that you don't like the way they're treating you or you don't like the way that you're seeing them treat somebody else. That's what that's about. And that's what that is. Right. So, um, like I said, well, I want to for yourself. <laughs> say it again. speaking up for yourself. We yes. all have the right to speak up for ourselves. Yes. And that's not bullying just because you're speaking up for yourself. Hello. So when you say somebody's doing something, know what, Whatever it is you're pointing the finger at them for doing, know what it means before you accuse somebody of something. And be sure about it before you lie on them. So I wanted to say that. Um, also, uh, we have a video uh, today that we're going to share. And then we're going to have a conversation about this, this uh, video and it has to do with bullying. Mark, we're ready for the video. Okay, so while we're waiting for Mark to uh, get that video started, today we're gonna be talking and, and about stop. social bullying suffered second and third degree burns to his face and legs from what his family says was a horrific attack by a bully. The bully um, called his name and lured him over around the corner. Give us just a minute to get this video going.
So while we're waiting, we are going to be talking about social bullying and we're going to be talking about antisocial bullying today. Um, and it has a lot to do with this video that we're about to see. So I guess we're having uh, technical difficulties. I do want to, uh, I'll go ahead and tell you what social bullying is. Social bullying is ignoring or leaving someone out on purpose, spreading rumors about someone, destroying relationships and friendships, embarrassing someone in public, telling lies or stories about someone to make others not like them. You exclude them from your groups or from sharing information. That's social bullying. Then we have anti-social bullying. It is shunning, excluding, gossiping, mimicking, spreading rumors, using offensive gestures and negative nonverbal body language. We're ready for the video. These images of six-year-old Dominic Crankle are heartbreaking, laying in a hospital bed, most of his body swollen and bandaged up after he suffered second and third degree burns to his face and legs from what his family says was a horrific attack by a bully. The bully um, called his name and lured him over around the corner and within a matter of seconds, he came back around the corner screaming, saying, Mommy, they let me on fire. They let me on fire. Dominic's sister, Kayla Deegan, says on Sunday afternoon, Dominic was playing in the backyard of their home off Louisiana Avenue with other kids who live below them. When Kayla says their eight-year-old neighbor got into a shed on the property and gained access to some gasoline and lighters, she says the boy then called her little brother over. He poured gasoline on a tennis ball took a lighter, lit it up, and just chucked it right at my brother's face. And then ran away from him and watched him burn. Tonight, Dominic is lucky to be alive. But what mm -hmm. happened has his loved ones outraged because they say this isn't the first time the bully has put him in the hospital, previously for a concussion. Two months ago, under the bully's mother's supervision, he was pushed into a wall and fell to the floor. And again, the mother refuses to admit her kid did it. News 4 went by the home and tried to speak to the other family allegedly involved, but they did not want to talk. And all police will say is up to four unattended children were seen playing with gasoline and lighting objects on fire. The incident is currently still under investigation as to the exact cause of the burn injuries. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. Dominic's loved ones say they want justice. It's heartbreaking. It's sickening to know that the family, there's nothing being done about this. This needs to be seen everywhere so everyone knows Dom's story and what he had to go through. And the extent it went to for someone to hopefully do something. Let's talk about this video. Yeah. This is heart wrenching. I can't imagine what it is like to have your kid running to you on fire because some other kid set them on fire. That has to be, that's heart wrenching. Also, the kids being able to get to gasoline. And I'm going to leave that right there. But I want to say, there, this was the second incident. So why, <laughs> why, why wasn't there more attention paid to these children? I mean, the child got a concussion the first time. So that's enough for me. I'm, I'm going to be involved. I'm going to be looking to see what's going on. And Jean can tell you <laughs> that I was the mother because of the experiences that I had as a child. I was the mother that was always looking outside to see what my kids were doing. So, and it was a constant thing. My kids got used to me looking, you know, opening the, the door, looking out down the street at the park where they were playing to see what was going on. 
And they got so used to me doing it that if I couldn't see them, if I stood in the door long enough with the door open, they would wave. Here I am, because I couldn't see them. They were in the equipment. You remember that, Gene? I know oh, you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So some parents may say that's doing too much. I didn't feel like I was doing too much. I know what I experienced as a kid, and I knew that I wanted to be well aware of what my kids was doing and how, you know, by checking on them constantly throughout the day. And for many years before that, they had to stay in the yard and play so I could come to the door and watch to see what was going on. So I can't imagine <laughs> what was happening that the parents weren't watching and why the parents are not taking responsibility for the actions of the kid that caused the concussion in the first place. And now he said, the same kid on fire. Gene, you have any comments? Yeah, I mean, like you said, where, where were the parents at this time? Yeah. You know, um, after the first incident, like, you can go into a coma and possibly die from a concussion. Yeah. You can go to sleep and never wake back up from a concussion. So why would it even be an option for your child to be anywhere near something like that? Yeah. Even if you couldn't get the the parents to to confess about right. the child, you know, doing such an act, you know, as a parent, what has transpired with your child. Why would you even? There, there wouldn't be an option. Would be no second opportunity or anything like right. that. But you know. And I want to add to it. I mean, the parents of the bully, you know, not admitting to anything um i wouldn't like you said i wouldn't i mean we both said it there wouldn't be no other opportunities i mean i'm gonna be watching i'm gonna be looking first of all i really don't want to play together because i don't know i mean next time you might kill my kid so that's just a little bit of discussion on this video <laughs> so gene you want to add anything yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, I have the questions, but, okay. um, yeah. So Gene's going to ask me some questions. We're going to have a little bit of a conversation about uh, this uh, incident, about these kinds of things happening and how we can help. So go ahead with the first question. Yeah. All right. So off topic, I just want to say I hate to possibly cast a negative light on the parents on both sides, on both sides of this situation. But this is a perfect example of parents not being involved in the comings and goings of their children. Uh, if you could single out just one important thing that the parents in this situation could have done differently or, or better, what, what would you, what would that be for you? So one important key word to this, uh, from my perspective and my point of view is trust. Kids trust the decisions made by their parents for their well-being and to keep them safe. So after the first hospitalization, both sets of parents or parent, depending on whether they're single or married, um, should have been monitoring the children. They should have been monitoring the children's relationships very, very closely. As we've seen in this situation, children can cause danger and harm and sometimes death on another one. So trust would be a key word that I would use in this particular incident. So parents, we need to remember that kids are trusting us to make the right decision to help them and to guide them through life. Yeah, well, for me, uh, in this particular situation, uh, I would go back to what we talked about in the last show, engagement. That would be the key word for me. Yes. Um, in order to, to gain that trust from your child, you have to be engaged. You know, you, you need to know what they're doing, what they're seeing, what they're thinking. You know, <clears throat> the more involved you are with your kids, the more open they are, the more apt they are to open up to talk to you about things. Correct. So, yeah, just... I think that's one thing that, that was missing in this particular situation. 
the engagement from the parents to the children. Yeah. There's no way that, that a parent that was engaged would truly engaged allow this to happen a second time. Right. My perspective though. I agree. I agree. Uh, so the second question is uh, the sec well the the article states that this is this particular child's second incident with this particular bully. Uh, what do you feel? Why do you feel that there might be such a major disconnection between the children and their parents on both sides of this tragedy? And again, I know that you don't know the people. I guess it would be what what is your speculation? So communication or the lack thereof, when the lines of communication and trust are open, it paves a way to have limitless conversations, lacking nothing. Uh, in other words, everything is open to communicate about with nothing left or hidden. So it opens up the lines of communication, builds trust, um, and so the the major disconnection, I would say, uh, was a lack of communication. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah, lack of communication, absolutely. Um, do you, so. This is an off the wall question. I didn't write this one down. Um, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> so, um, I guess the question would be in a situation like this, the kid is six, right? Yes. That that the yeah, the tennis ball is tossed at. So at that age, like even why is that child away from you? Like if they're gonna be playing outside, they need it at that age. They need to be somewhere where you can see them readily. Like right. you said, front yard. Yeah. No, you know, nowhere past that. Right. Um And then the eight-year-old kid is the, you know, the one that that's have an opportunity to go to a shed with gasoline and lighters and matches and. Yep. Like there's too much freedom there. Right. I mean, so I mean, you know, uh, there's there's a saying that you know, a cliche: freedom is not free which means that there's responsibilities that come with freedom. You know, yeah. you have to earn that freedom, you know, especially yeah. at that age, you haven't earned any, uh, you haven't shown enough responsibility to be out of my sight at six years old or eight years old. No. <laughs> You're going to be right walking, reach out and touch you by two steps. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, you gotta learn that. No. I agree with that. And, uh, you know, I agree with that because of how I raised y'all. Right. Um, there wasn't, I mean, of course, a parent can't see everything that's, you know, that a kid is doing. But if you're going checking regularly, you have an idea of what they're doing, you know. Um, and so as far as like going on the side of the house and going in the backyard, I can't see you there. When I come to the door, I expect to see you in the front yard. Kids are being taken, you know, at young ages like that from their front yard. So, and we lived on the Navy base. So we were able, I mean, there was a sense of security. There was, you know, it was guarded, a guarded area. So that made it easier for me, but kids need to be looked at. I mean, there's sex, human trafficking, uh, and there's no, I mean, that is a good age. That's a prime age for somebody to just snatch you out of your yard. It's happened many times where parents say, well, the last time I seen them, they were in the front yard. So people are watching them just like you should be. So you don't know who down the street or who across the street is watching them playing outside and watching how often you come to check on them. So um, that's just my take that's just my thing that's just what i did it gave me comfort and a sense of peace <laughs> knowing that i was really watching my kids and that you know even my husband 
uh, would go outside and read his book sitting on the porch while they played in the yard. You remember that too, don't you? Oh, yeah, I remember. <laughs> yep. So, I mean, you can only do what you can do. But as a parent, I know I, I didn't want any bad things happening to my kids, not like parents do at all. I'm not saying that don't get it twisted. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that we have a responsibility and our kids trust us to make the right decisions and to make good decisions concerning their well-being. Right. So to, leave it. Go ahead. I was going to say to add on to what you were saying about, you know, constantly watching. Like, so on the reverse side, you know, if you have a parent that's constantly watching, like you're going to, you're going to be on edge <laughs> constantly Make sure I do that, you know, don't do something, you know, that she sees and I'm going to get in trouble for it. Right. So you know, the child's going to be on their toes at all times. Yeah. Like, okay, let me make sure I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing right. so I don't get in trouble, you know. I mean, you know, right. as a kid, you were like, oh, I hate it, but you grow up and in hindsight, you realize, like, she was just looking out for me, trying to keep, right. keep my little crazy butt safe. <laughs> And you see that easier when you have your own kids. Oh, oh yeah. now I understand what mom or what dad was doing, why they did this or why they did that. But when you're young, just like me, when I was young, I, mama's mean, you know, she's mean to me, you know. I mean, I don't know that I said those exact words, but I thought that when I couldn't get my way or do something I wanted, you know, to do. But when yeah. I had kids, then I understood more of what she was talking about. Yep. <clears throat> and why she was doing the things she did. Right. Yep. That was her showing love. That's just yep. that's, that's real love right there. When you, yep. you set firm, you gotta set firm boundaries. Yeah. In all relationships. Hey, this is what this is what <laughs> we can do. This is what yep. we cannot do. I right. will not have that. That's negotiable. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's pretty much yes on every term. So yep. <laughs> there's an agreement that you have. You know, that's what Relationships are agreement between, yes. you know, two or more people. So, you know, even a, a, a you know, a, a parent-child relationship is an agreement of sorts. So, yes. you know, I have to approach it like that. Yes. All right. So question three. After this child's first incident with this particular bully, what would you say is a healthy way of preventing the second devastating event? So a good way to combat and to prevent bullying is uh, encourage conversations. Uh, communicate with each other, parents and children. Communication is vital. Communication is very, very important. So parents talk to kids and let them know how their negative uh, behaviors impact others negatively. You have to, you have to let them know that. And then so teach them how to set boundaries and to tell the bully to stop. I don't appreciate the way that you are treating me and I am telling you to stop it. And you have to be firm. That's a way to prevent bullying. So if you're crying when you say it, then they're going to tease you more. They're going to do more to you. So you have to be able to say it in a firm voice. And then report the bully to uh, an adult that is close by. You got to tell, you got to say something. Forget this snitching crap. Uh, you are getting hurt and you're going to get more hurt if you don't say something to somebody that can help you and that can stop the behavior. So, and then uh, if uh, there's a threat of physical harm, call the police, contact the police. So those are healthy ways of uh, prevention from bullying. Yeah. I would say from the, the parent standpoint, I, the first word that comes to me is limits. Uh, create limited involvement with, with said bully. You know, if this person has caused harm to my child before, I'm not going to allow that person to be around my child alone ever again. Right. Um, you know, and as you were involved as, you know, as a parent with me, um, I'm the same. You know, if I if I see a, a bullying situation going on with my child, I'm I'm a, I'm going to the bully with my child. Let yeah. me know, hey, this is not how it's about to happen. You leave my child alone or, you know, 
that we'll take this further. You know, not a not in a threatening um, from a threatening sense, but just again letting the bully know I'm setting firm boundaries right here. This will yeah. not transpire anymore. Right. And then and be adamant about it. Don't don't slide. In a situation like that, after you you the child got a concussion, like there's there's no way that there's gonna be a, a second time. If right. I I just yeah, there's there's a lot of things we don't know about the story, but just just from that alone, there's no way that you're getting a second opportunity to possibly kill my child. Right. And then um by having talking to um have by having a conversation with the other parents to know that they were in denial about you know the kid their kid bullying your kid. Um <laughs> You've already went, you know, farther with this. So right. what else is left besides you saying, I'm going to watch my kid. You're not going to, you know, you might not say it to the kid. I'm going to be watching you, but you, you got to watch. You got to be aware. You got to, man, you got to engage. You got to get involved. You, you just have to for the sake and safety of your kid. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, question four is, in the article, it was said that the parents of the accused bully denied the accusations after both incidents. So if, in this case, if a parent has a child that is a known bully or has been accused of bullying, what can be done to, uh, what can they do to prevent further cases of bullying? So one of the things that can be done is that uh, you can discuss the importance of identifying feelings and dealing with them in a positive way. So what are you feeling? What are you thinking? What were you feeling before you, you know, did that to that kid? You know, what were you thinking? What were some of your thoughts? So discuss the importance of identifying feelings and doing something positive with those feelings. If it's not a positive feeling, if it's a negative feeling, you have to change that. Let's, let's change that by thinking in a better way. You don't want to hurt and harm somebody. You want to be kind to others. You want to treat others the way that you want to be treated. So it was a negative feeling. So we, we want to switch that up. Let's make it a positive feeling. If you're sad, happy, get happy, you know, for example. Uh, and I'm saying that, but you have to change that negative feeling to a positive feeling. So discuss their feelings. What were they thinking? What were they feeling before they did that negative behavior. Right. And then uh, teach children self-control. So when it comes to a bully, you have to teach them self-control and help them decrease impulsive behaviors uh, and help them consider the consequences of their behaviors. So before acting out and bullying another. So when you help kids to recognize uh, self-control and then how to decrease the impulsive behaviors, if you let them know there's consequences because of your impulsive negative behaviors, chances are, just like you just said a little while ago about, you know, I know she's going to come to that door. I know <laughs> she's watching, so I don't want to get in trouble. So I better make sure I'm doing the right thing, you know? So that's uh, a consequence, knowing you're going to get punished for that impulsive negative behavior that you caused and created uh, as a result of your negative feelings and cast that onto somebody else. So those are two ways um, that you um, can help a bully think in different ways and deal with their negative bullying behaviors. Yeah. So I agree. I want to um, reiterate what you said about um, informing them about the fact that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Everything has consequences. I would even go as far as if, if my child is the bully, um, sit down and talk to them about, you know, hey, you you punched this child, for instance. You know, as an adult, this is an assault charge, you know, which, you know, they, they, and, and break it down to them like that. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't work there, I would, you know, kind of go the, um, scared straight route, you know, take, make them go to, to a, a prison, you know, and, and have to 
be around inmates and they educate them from their personal experiences, like how they did what, what you're doing and now they're here. Right. You know, um, you sometimes words are not enough. You can say what you want, but you know, if it doesn't resonate with a with a person deep down, then you you just said a lot of words that sounded good, but nothing that, that struck them deep down. So, you know, the scared straight thing. I, I believe they still have programs like that. If not, it can be created. Yeah, and by letting them know that um, as an adult, it's a, an assault uh, charge, that lets them know that as you get older and you get mad and you put your hands on somebody just because that's how you're feeling, the end result of that is going to be jail, jail time. time. So that could help. I mean, some people talking about going to jail don't scare them at all. It means nothing. But as a kid, you know, um, it can make them think twice before they physically assault somebody um, mm -hmm. or attack somebody verbally um, or mentally or emotionally, you know, and teaching kids and teaching people, not just kids, but teaching them the effects of bullying, the impact of bullying, the impact that it has on a person's life when you're saying negative things to them, when you're bullying them, you know, with your, you know, verbiage, you know, talking to them mean and talking down to them, insulting them, humiliating them. Uh, when you're doing all of those things, it creates a negative impact in the person's life. And so that person later can become a bully. Or, you know, even at that time, they get around the right people that are vulnerable enough because they couldn't, um, like, for example, maybe, you know, I'm bully, I can't bully you, you're bullying me, but I can't bully you back. So when I get in the right environment with the right people, there's somebody in that group that may be vulnerable to me. And so I attack them, you know. Um, by insulting them, humiliating them, you know, talking negatively about their weight, their race, you know, their culture, uh, excluding them from groups, doing all of these negative things to them because I couldn't bully you back, but here's somebody that's vulnerable, vulnerable to me and I can do it to them. Right. Makes sense. Oh, yeah. I was going to say even taking it a little further, uh, and people, some people may think this is extreme, but like um, explaining to your child and, sh and showing them uh, via evidence um, that like situations like school shootings are, are from people who've been bullied and they got to the point where, you know, some people commit suicide, some yep. people commit homicide. Yep. You know, you have to understand like there, there are levels and variations of way people act, how yep. they react, I'm sorry, to um, the effects of bullying, you know, either way, it's not positive. It's not right. a positive thing. You're contributing to, you know, causing someone else misery and people have different reactions to misery. You know, right. some people fight, some people flight, you know, that that's the natural human, human thing. You either fight, yeah. fight, fight, flight, or freeze. Yeah. You know, one of those three. So, you know, you're causing misery to someone else. And there are, again, consequences to your actions that can be up to you losing your life or yeah. you being the blame for someone else taking theirs, you know, so. And I don't like the thought personally of either one of those. I don't want to take a life and I don't want mine taken. <laughs> right. And I sure ain't going to take mine, you know, so <laughs> I'm just saying so. You know, um, where is the love in all this? All this negative behavior, where is the love? So we want to remind you that love is compassionate. Love is kind. Love is patient. Um, love is meek and gentle. And I said patient. So those are things. Go ahead. Compassionate. Yes. Empathetic supporting those are kind of, what, was, what was the last one i think it's an understanding yeah so 
that is love. Those are examples of love, of real love. Um, so I want to give you seven healthy, uh, seven tips for healthy relationships. Acceptance. Accept people for who they are. You do not have to accept their ill treatment of you. Um, less stress on you trying to make and mold someone for your own, for, um, wait a minute, less stress on you trying to make and mold someone your way if you accept people as they are. Again, you do not have to accept their ill treatment of you. So communicate, communicate with others the way you want them to communicate with you. That's tip number two. You can interject at any time. <laughs> I'm enjoying listening. What are you okay. Saying? And then so tip number three is listen. You want to be heard when you're talking. So listen to other people when they're talking. Give what you want to receive. Yeah. Number four, be flexible. Allow for change and growth within the relationship. These are tips for healthy relationships. So number five, be compassionate. Be willing to help others when you see they need help. Some people just, that's a healthy tip. I'll leave that right there. So, <laughs> and tip number six is be merciful. Be willing to give people another chance. Don't give them the punishment we feel like they may deserve. And tip number seven, forgive. It is an action or a choice to release an offender. Forgiveness helps you heal from the hurt that they've caused you. It's a gift to yourself. And then I wanna say, we live in a world full of brokenhearted people with broken spirits. We, we've all experienced, experienced emotions of disappointment, inadequacy, and regret derived from choices and decisions we've made. So those are seven healthy tips for a healthy, seven tips for healthy relationships. Um, Gene, you want to add anything? No, I just appreciate those. Uh, there was one you, you brought up communication and listening. It was uh, yeah. listening. And one, so one thing that my therapist uh, kind of, I mean, you know, it's something that I already knew, but she, she put it in a way that, that made it stick out to me a little more. And I'm going to um, summarize it. But uh, she was saying, when you listen to a person, listen actively, not with the mindset that I'm uh, making a checklist in my mind to argue back each point <laughs> or constantly cutting the person off, <laughs> defending yeah. a point that you haven't even heard the end of. Yeah. If you just sit back and literally, even if you have to, something that she suggested, um, when you're having a conversation and you want to make points, keep a notebook by and write down your thoughts and then address them after the person is able to express themselves fully without interruption. And it's something I have to practice on myself, you know, especially in heightened emotion. It, it's easy to, you know, cut a person off. I mean, we do it a regular conversation. I know I do. Um, yeah. But it, it's good practice to, again, when you're having a conversation with a person, where especially in, in heated ones, where you write down your thoughts while actively listening to the person um, and just giving them the, your your total attention right? and not look for an opportunity to be defensive. Yeah. Uh, listening is very important. And I, I like what she said about just writing stuff down because um, when you are sitting there waiting for them to hurry up and get done, you stop, you cut off what they're, the rest of what they're saying, you don't hear it because you're so focused on how I'm going to respond to this that you said that I didn't like or that I didn't agree with. So listening is very important and what she said is, is valuable. So Jean, uh, you want to talk a little bit about your video before we uh, add your video. Jean is going to share some how he comes to a peaceful place in his mind after traumatic experiences, after unpleasant 
experiences? Yeah. So I've been practicing yoga for about 15 years now. And I've been an instructor for probably about 12, 13. So yoga is, yoga means union in Sanskrit, you know, yoking two things together. So um, yoga for me, not only the physical aspects of yoga, the, the you know, asana practice or the, the physical movements, but the meditation, the studying, the um, having right thoughts, you know, affirmations, things, things of that sort. Um, compassion towards my fellow man, you know, these, these things help me go to a place of recognizing that I am a mirror for everyone that I come in contact with, which is why in yoga, you say namaste, namaste, which means the God in me, the light in me, the universe in me, or however you see the higher power. I see that light in you as well as I see it in myself. So the God in me sees the God in you. Um, and just bring myself back to the reality um, that we are all one. And then there are the things I can do, physical movements, um, and, and, and uh, consciously using my breath to calm myself during times of stress. Um, yeah, it, it, just, it just brings about a, a certain tranquility and serenity um, in the midst of the chaos of life. So here's here's a, um, uh, a short video of my yoga practice, and also if you're out there and you need um, corporate wellness classes, or individual practice on Zoom, or in person, you can contact me at premierfitnessmemphis dot at gmail dot com. Check out this video. Greetings and welcome to Premier Fitness. I'm Gene Williams, your yoga instructor for the day, and I'm here to tell you about the benefits of yoga. The mental benefits, yoga's incorporation of meditation and breathing can help improve a person's mental well-being. Regular yoga practice creates mental clarity and calmness, increases body awareness, relieves chronic stress patterns, relaxes the mind, centers the attention, and sharpest concentration. The physical benefits are the relaxation techniques incorporated in yoga can lessen chronic pain, arthritis, headaches, and carpal tunnel syndrome. Yoga can also lower blood pressure and reduce insomnia. Other physical benefits are increased flexibility, increased muscle strength and tone, Improved respiration, energy, and vitality. Maintaining a balanced metabolism, weight reduction, cardiovascular and circulatory health, improved athletic performance, and protection from injury. All these and more come from a regular yoga practice. Come join me, Gene Williams of Premier Fitness, to establish or recreate a personal yoga practice. You want to add anything? 
<laughs> yeah, this is like I remember that day. Like that was a fun day. And like that yeah. that area, like that's one of my favorite places in the city of Memphis to practice, right by the water. It's just it's so serene. I get lost. I used to like literally sometimes just be out there practicing for two, two, three hours at a time and not realize, like, man, I've been on this mat for three hours. <laughs> Is when when it's when it's something that helps and clears your mind, like it's it's addictive. Just having that that peace of mind that yeah, the tranquility inside and out is just it's, it's an amazing thing. I'm I'm so glad to have come across yoga, especially in my mid twenties. So yeah, that's uh, fantastic. I mean. Water really is watching water really can be serene and listening to water. Oh, yeah. um, I love listening to water. I love listening to the nature sounds, birds chirping, um, the running water, waterfalls. Um, Rain. Yeah, it's, yeah. I just get lost, can yeah. get lost in, in thought uh, about that. I mean, and I love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> so that's Gene's way of finding, um, coming to a peaceful place in his mind uh, out of chaos and trauma and unpleasant um, circumstances and situations in his life. And I have my own way and uh, I'm sure whoever is listening has their own way. So my some of my ways are, I pray a lot. So pray, 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 pray. That's me. <laughs> and I get more situations and more circumstances happening in my life to uh, for me to pray about because that's what I do. So I also listen to um, videos with water sounds and birds chirping and nature sounds. Uh, that's peaceful to me. I listen to uh, inspirational speakers, read inspirational books, um, listen to um, inspirational music, uh, gospel music, praise music, um, sometimes jazz. Um, and I read the Bible, I study the Bible. So those are some of the ways that I come to a peaceful place in my mind after a chaotic situation. Um, um, and like I said, everybody has their own. Those are some examples. You may think of some ways that, you know, that you, uh, of things that come to your mind or ways that you come to your own peaceful place in your mind. So, and that's good. You got to have that. Um, you want to add anything, Gene? Yeah. Um, definitely finding, finding something that, that resonates with you helps you find a peace, a peace of mind, you know, something like, creating music, artwork, being, being around friends, if that's your thing. You know, some people's exercise, some people it's, you know, uh, isolation, you know. Just find find something that brings you peace because life is going to bring chaos. Yes. You are powerful. And, and you know, now the, the saying is, is, was one way and it, it's been changed a little bit, but the saying originally was God never puts anything on you that you can't handle or, you know, universe now is how it's said in, in some circles, either way, same concept. Everything that comes into your life is a way to help you grow. Yes, um, absolutely. All the struggles in life are growing pains. Yes. You know, and you got to think about that though. The second word is pain, but the first word is growing. So with whatever you go through, and I have to tell myself this constantly, is that whatever you're going through is to grow you, to make yes. you a better version of yourself, more in tune with your highest nature, whatever, however you see that. It helps you tune into that 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 best version of you, if you allow it to. And in all things, we have choice. We always yes. have choice. Even in situations like this, for the bullying, you have a choice. You can be a bully, or you can choose not to be. You can be a victim of bullying or you can choose not to be. It's all choice. But you have to use your inner strength, your inner God, your inner universe, however however you say it. Take knowledge of your own personal power 
and the power that was given to you by that which created everything. So yeah, that's my spiel. That's that's good. So we have shared a lot of information with you about bullying. Uh, we've shared uh, information, uh, given information to you about love, what real love looks like. Where is the love when you're bullying and controlling others? There's no love. So we encourage you to show more love, give more love, and you get what you get. This is the end of our show. We wish you love, joy, uh, peace, <laughs> and joy. We don't wish it. We give it to you hey, and ask you go. to take it. There you go. Open your hands and, up and receive it. Yes. <laughs> so that is the end of our show for today. We uh, look forward to uh, seeing you on our show next week. And if you have not, um, if you would like uh, information about the different types of bullying, you can please uh, be sure to email me at misunderstood at gmail.com. I will be happy to send you a list of the different types of bullying because bullying is not just physical. Uh, it is There's no age range for bullying. And I will be more than happy to share this information with you. Um, and uh, also Mercy Proves Love Coaching is uh, another uh, business of mine where I uh, do life coaching, spiritual coaching, forgiveness coaching, and trauma coaching. So I'd be happy to do some coaching with you to help you uh, get beyond your traumatic experiences, to teach you more, educate you more about bullying and to get all of those negative things out of you and help you to receive the gift of forgiveness. Um, so this is our show. Join us next time. Bye for now. Peace.